ooh, 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 ooh. Check this out. Welcome to the mailbag on the Dean Show. I'm Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes, we'd like to talk about some of the mail that we receive here on a regular basis. Some of the letters that we receive from you are very stimulating and cause us to reflect and go back to the sources of Islam so that we're able to determine exactly what the answer to these questions are. I received one today that is actually representative of a lot of the emails that we get talking about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his marriage to his wife Aisha. They're concerned often in these uh, uh, letters and emails to us about the age of Aisha, and they're asking us, for instance, in this case, we'd like to know, is it true that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, married his wife Aisha when she was a child? And if so, what does this mean, and how do we understand that about child brides in Islam? The questioner goes on, but it seems to continue in this same way. What we want to begin with is to tell you that Islam is always about rights and limits. Never is it permissible in Islam to take advantage of anybody else. One over another is not acceptable in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, has told us clearly that he does not oppress and he hates it when we oppress and he forbids, forbids humans to oppress each other. So if you're imagining some form of oppression going on here, you can put your mind at ease. This is not the case. Let us now investigate what was the condition of the people and what were their traditions and customs at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula in those days used to marry a girl at any age. There was no limit on it. Because it wasn't about their sexual intercourse or something like this. It was about establishing the right of marriage of a man getting to marry a girl and marrying into a family. Often it was about tribalism and there was little if any stipulation that the girl had any say so or any rights. As a matter of fact, that was the last and the least of their considerations of whether or not the woman had anything to say about the matter. Additionally, in those days, it was considered a shame on a family if they had a child that was a girl born to them. So the men would actually take some of, some of the men would take these little girls when they were born, newborn babies, into the desert and bury them alive and leave them. That was considered the manly, manly thing to do. And when a child was orphaned, let's say there was a little girl or a father passed away or parents died, then a man could come along and claim that little girl and say, I'm going to marry this girl and take all the wealth that goes along, you know, that she would inherit. Additionally, uh, people would take the wealth of children, boys or girls, and mix it with their own money and claim they were improving the condition for the child until they were old enough to make decisions for themselves and obviously benefiting themselves by this mingling of funds. So when Islam came, it did come in stages. It wasn't all at once that everybody just had to drop everything and do all these commandments, but it did come, first of all, to recognize that it is God who has the authority over man. And this was the Tawheed or the monotheism that was so much uh, influential throughout the teaching of Muhammad, peace be upon him. And here he was now saying that it's God's authority showing you how to behave, especially in, in this idea of being married. So there's a chapter now in the Quran about women. It's not the only place in the Quran you find about dealing with women, not at all. But for sure, if you want to look quickly and find a, an issue, marriage, the treatment of women, wives in general, wives specifically, and then divorce. You can find a lot of this in this same chapter. But now about divorce, we do have another chapter for that. But what we're going to focus on now is about this issue of age of Aisha. So in chapter 4, the women, the one I'm talking about, you go to verse number 19, and it says, O you who believe, 
you cannot inherit women against their will, meaning that you cannot take from them their inheritance, and meaning also that you cannot marry them without their permission or their consent, and they have to be old enough for the age of consent. This is very clear. A man could not marry a girl. He could only marry a woman. A woman meaning that she's old enough to have children and old enough and mature enough in her mind to make the, these kinds of decisions. <clears throat> now let us turn to the subject at hand. We're talking about the age now of Aisha. Only Aisha herself is telling us about this. She is telling us, for in her own words, what her age was when her mother came to her and she was playing outside, playing outside in the dirt with her toys or whatever. Her mother comes to her and says, come in the house. She was six years old. Mother takes her into the house to see her father. Her father is there offering her hand in marriage now to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, offering the hand of his daughter to the Prophet, who is his best friend. And this was a custom, a tradition in their society. So it was definitely well within the uh, limits of the society they lived in. It was approved totally. But look at this. It wasn't accepted by Muhammad. How do we know? How do we know? Well, because if you keep reading, you'll see that she went back outside and continued playing. And this is to indicate what? That although this is very much appreciated and accepted in, at least in intention, yet because the girl's not old enough yet, she must be the one to decide. That's why you find another hadith or saying or tradition in the same book of Bukhari that says a different age. Well, you might wonder, well, how is it six years old or is it nine years old? Maybe they turned the number upside down. You know, a six and a nine, you could reverse it. But that's not possible in the Arabic because when you see the number nine in Arabic, you see the number six, they're not the same as they are with the English letters we use today. So that wasn't the case. Not at all. In fact, she says a similar incident takes place on another occasion. Again, her mother's taking her inside and offering her hand in marriage. The father is offering the hand in marriage to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it is in this time now she's older and she's uh, evidently now able to make the decision. But in any case, they did not have any marriage until she gave consent and she had to be old enough or they couldn't have done it. So that's number one. Put your mind at ease about that. Number two is that even when they got married, she didn't go to live with him until she was old enough to have babies. That's also a condition and understanding of an Islam. This doesn't happen. And even then, he took his time with her. And that she said herself, listen to this, that they used to run and play and enjoy being together. And she used to beat him in the races, she said, until she got older, when she got fatter, she said, and then he used to beat her in the races. She talks about having a lot of fun together and growing and, and enjoying his company, being with him, and they grew in their mutual love and respect for each other very much. In her whole life, she never said any disparaging remarks against her husband. It was only the most glowing of report that comes from her about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Although he died while she was still a young lady, she continued throughout her life, the rest of her life, with full honor and respect for her husband. She never remarried. She never had any boyfriends or callers coming by or any of the rest of it. She became also one of the greatest of the scholars, especially in the area of telling us about women's needs and women's conditions and the things that Islam is providing for women. We know a lot about the case of women in Islam from Aisha. Radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her. Additionally, I would like to mention that when you consider how much he loved her, that when he was dying, he asked to be with her. He wanted to be with her. And he made a point to be there. And she would come in and put the towel on his head when he had such a fever. And she would try to cull him down 
and then he would take it off and he would talk for a minute and then put it back on. And this is recorded in some of the sayings also of Muhammad. And then when he passed away, he passed away with his head in her lap. Now this shows a great love from both of them. Yet she didn't wail and cry and tear at her hair or any of the rest of it, which was a custom, by the way, of the ignorant pagan people. Instead, she understood that he was going to his Lord. She also understood throughout the rest of her life that she also would go to her Lord and that they would be together again in paradise, living happily ever after. I'd like you now to contrast this story that I've just told you with the story of Romeo and Juliet, the story that we usually associate with Valentine's Day, the story that we usually associate with true love and young love. But in reality, the story that Shakespeare presents for us is no match for the beautiful story that I've just told you. Because those children, and they were children, they were very young teenagers, perhaps 12, 14 years old, Romeo and Juliet. They were going against the wishes of their parents and sneaking behind their back. And they were not married. There was no marriage involved. It was just an affair that they were having. And then one committed suicide and then the other followed. So this is the tragic result of the kind of love that's not acceptable in Islam. There is no boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, and there's certainly no sneaking behind the backs of the parents. Everything in Islam is out in the open, and everything in marriage is done by contract, and there's never any sex before marriage. So put it in perspective and understand that this is the story that Shakespeare probably wishes that he would have told instead of Romeo and Juliet. I hope this was able in some way to put your mind at ease and relax about this subject because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was in fact sent as a mercy to all of the mankind and jinn. Until next time, from here on the mailbag, on the Dean Show, peace. Assalamu alaikum wa